many rooms, a lot of enthusiasm. And then, of course, you know, we contribute 3.42 to the GDP of the country and to nearly 25% of the foreign currency is earned by tourism in Nepal. So at this situation, as you know, we are in a very, very difficult uh, time. Um, one tourist directly or in the supports directly or indirectly to 12 employees, you know, in Nepal. So when there is a full stop of uh, tourists coming into Nepal, you can understand what challenges, um, you know, we are going to face. However, the lockdown uh, uh, decision of the government is also very much supported by us because that was the right thing to do. It was done at the right time. So we have to support. Now, um, you know, we were enthusiastic, like you said, like 2020 being the uh, visit Nepal here, a lot of advertisement, a lot of, uh, you know, identification of the products were happening in Nepal. So, you know, all that enthusiasm is definitely crushed. But then, like you said, do I see a light at the end of the tunnel? Yes, I do. Because probably this is the time, you know, once things start settling in, what can we do? We can start working on capacity building. We can start analyzing, evaluating all the strength and the gaps that Nepal had. Uh, earlier, you know, we were very popular with the three golden triangles and the trekking. And now with the Visit Nepal year campaign, we've identified many exciting products. So for that, instead of just getting excited with the- I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So instead of just getting excited with the products, there's a lot of homework that we can do is to really get into the research, to identify the products, to look into the connectivity, the, you know, working on the standardization of the accommodation, you know, marketing, um, food safety, um, garbage management, um, you know, various things. So sometimes I feel we, there is an opportunity because when the, they always say when it actually takes the dip, it is bound to come up again. This has always been, uh, you know, a study in the past that when things take the, take a dip, it has to come up. So what I feel is maybe this is a time for us to do work on capacity building, that when we are actually ready, maybe we will be 10 times better. Maybe we will be able to cater to different kind of tourism. You know, maybe we will be uh, known as a, destination with so many um, uh, products and a safe destination. So, you know, we could work on that. So these are uh, the way to be, uh, optim uh, to be optimistic about the whole thing. This is what I feel, this is what I have also been briefing the minister to say when things get a little bit, um, you know, calmer and uh, favorable for us to, uh, you know, work on these uh, lines, maybe that is what we should do. But then of course, the current situation you know, like I mentioned earlier, also is it's about this. It's about the situation. In this situation, the government has to make sure that the citizens are confident that they can get the supply of the food and medicine. This is one. And of course, for the business, be it tourism or any other business, there are two factors: is how the government is going to support the employer, employers, and the employee. The employer. Many countries have come up with various packages. Maybe we, we are not in a situation, maybe the government in Nepal is not in a situation to give us that much, but then, you know, we, they have to work. Things are not, uh, things are getting late. You know, they have announced few of, uh, you know, about 25% of what we had uh, suggested, but that is definitely not enough. They have to do some uh, study on what the neighboring countries have done to support their, uh, you know, uh, support, uh, support the tourism industry and looking at all that i think an uh, immediate package has to come out to look into the monitorium support for the employers and as for the employees of course the salary is equally important so for one month of course everybody has said that we have to support the situation but for, from the second month it has to be the government who has to come to uh, you know come forward to help and in my opinion i think 2019 is a year where we will not be seeing any uh, tourism, but then for the 2020, you know, we could be ready. So this is what I want to tell you is, it's not everything is, you know, there's always reason for everything. The world is going through 
uh, crisis, which none of us were prepared. But you know, all we can do is to you know go with the flow. You know, take each day as it comes and see how we can be ready when the time is right to strike back. Because countries like us, that there, there, there is you know, there's only one thing that we one of the most important thing that we can be proud of is the tourism and the beauty of the country that we have. We have so much to offer. So, you know, we must be confident and move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Srezana Rana. Uh, the capacity building and resilience, since resilience has been synonymous to Nepal, Nepal has seen a lot of uh, setbacks in tourism. Starting from 1999, December 24th, uh, the hijack of Indian airline plane, followed by Royal Massacre, 9-11, Mao's insurgency, uh, and five years the ago, uh, the earthquake. Uh, so Nepal, or the tourism of Nepal, has seen all these ups and downs. And what we have noticed, that Nepal is a quick recovery destination, and people would not give in very easily. So we'll come back to you. Now, since the word you use crisis and you did see the light at the end of the tunnel. Now, let me move on to John. John uh, was recently based out in China. And uh, interestingly, this COVID also started from Wuhan. But here I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about crisis. Uh, I read somewhere that in Chinese word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other one represents opportunity. So John, how do you take this COVID uh, crisis, uh, whether it's real danger or there's abundance of opportunity? Well, uh, thank you, Pankaj. It's uh, great to see you and it's great to see all the panelists. And I wanna say hello to uh, all of our attendees. Uh, not only from Nepal, but uh, throughout the world. Uh, namaste, great to see you. Uh, as you know, and you've mentioned, uh, I've been teaching for Arizona State University in Hainan, China. And so to give you perspective, uh, Nepal gets maybe a little over a million visitors per year, but Hainan, China gets 70 million domestic tours a year. Wow. So it's a very, very popular destination there, uh, a great place to study tourism, particularly Chinese tourism. So if I want to start off on a positive note, uh, we've seen uh, the measures that China has taken and uh, literally shutting down a billion people basically for two months. But uh, now I'm, I'm in the United States, I'm teaching my students uh, online but life is getting back to normal there fairly quickly. So tonight, uh, some of my uh, colleagues were out at a night market and uh, they were eating. They were very happy to be having a beer outside and be with people again. So I think that's a very positive uh, uh, look at things that if a, a country of that size uh, can address the problem and then uh, rectify it and uh, that hopefully we'll see our top of our bell curve now, and hopefully that will get uh, a bit better. <coughs> the second thing that I wanted to bring up, Pankaj, and you brought it up at the very beginning, is that two years ago in Nepal, we had the International Conference on Accessible Adventure. And so what we wanted to do was sort of bring in sort of a new image, new brand image for Nepal, that it wasn't just for the young and adventurous, but there were a lot of other attributes for the country. So I, I'm glad you brought that up because it's one of my recommendations is that there are a lot of new niche markets out there that uh, we need to address, look for the blue ocean strategy of looking for the new markets and start talking to them now. So when things get better, that, uh, that you have that dialogue, they're starting to explore more. We were looking at the senior market. We were looking at uh, the accessible but disabled market, a huge market in the, US, in the world, about a billion people. So there are new markets to start talking to, to start really promoting to. And I think as uh, Srijana said, uh, this is a time for capacity building. It's a time to, to keep the dialogues going. So what I wanted to do with my presentation today 
Uh, I, I'm teaching tourism planning. Uh, I've got about 100 students. And uh, let me share a screen here. So basically, uh, my, my, uh, my challenge to the students over this week was to go to the UN World Tourism Organization site. And they have a challenge here to address the COVID crisis. And the challenge was, look at the it, it called Healing Solutions Tourism Challenge. And they're challenging, basically, um, they're challenging the world to come up with solutions on addressing the resilience and recovery for uh, the COVID crisis, the health crisis. And again, they're calling on innovators to, to look at three different categories. And basically, that would be in uh, health. Here are the three categories. Healing for people, kind of focusing on safety measures, sanitation methods, early detection for the stakeholders, the employees, the tourists, uh, tour operators. The second category was healing for prosperity. And that was looking at kind of the business economy. What can we do to help the business economy recover? And the third category was looking at healing for destinations, looking at solutions for uh, recovery techniques, communication crisis, crisis management, uh, branding, uh, and travel confidence. So we worked with the students over the last couple of days, and I've uh, focused and uh, summarized their, our, all of our discussion and comments just to sort of get some ideas generated for our, our panel here and our audience. So looking at the first category, healing for people, and safety strategy. Here are a few of the uh, recommendations that uh, have been brought up and that we discussed. Number one, airports and borders are gonna be very, very important. We're gonna have to look at and really work at having a professional presentation at each airport. Again, we had horrible problems in the US initially with four hour waits coming in from Europe when they were, were starting to stop the European flights. That can't happen. The airport is the first experience that a visitor has. And so again, we're gonna have to, as the health crisis winds down, there's still gonna be a good opportunity here for screening. So again, we should be working on how can we professionally unobtrusively screen at the airport. We should screen our outbound uh, passengers as well. Uh, and, and one of the suggestions was the foreigners that are coming in when they're at immigration, they should get a contact card that will have all the required sort of information, phone numbers, websites, and an app to really for connectivity to sort of give them confidence that there is a, a background of support there. Uh, we talked about airlines. Initially, airlines maybe should institute a, a no middle seat policy. Again, who's ever traveled in the last couple of years, there's never a free seat on any airplane that might have to change as a transition. Just give a little bit more space there. I think that would be kind of important. Again, on airplanes, they should have a health and safety educational video. Uh, they should hand out uh, masks if people don't have them. Destinations should look at having a smartphone app with a tourism-oriented health and safety updates, uh, contact numbers. They might even think of subsidizing SIM cards for the uh, for cell phones so people can have con connectivity. The sectors of tourism, the lodging, uh, F&B, transport and attractions should again, they're gonna have to evolve into uh, you know, a carrying capacity of maybe uh, of, of, of 30 or 40% until things get better and then be able to constantly add. Uh, there should be sanitation stations everywhere. Talking about employees, again, relating this to the healing and, and health, uh, there should be daily health checks for tourism employees. The employees should be educated on health concerns, be able to be uh, uh, observers out there, uh, and employees should be properly uh, protected when necessary. Again, tourists should be monitored at various entry points, again, to, to uh, really sort of keep that, uh, that new influx in check if, if that appears to happen. Uh, food service, one of the, the uh, recommendations was maybe limit buffet presentations. Uh, table seating should include more spacing. Uh, there should be more room service, boxed meals. 
uh, looking at pu putting together your tour packages. Again, group size initially should be limited. Again, think of the 40 uh, packs bus. Uh, in the interim, maybe the 20 packs bus filling the 40 bus seat bus is probably the most uh, kind of important way of, of addressing the evolution. Again, we're going to start off slow and we're going to build back to normal capacity. Now, talking about the, uh, the second challenge from the UNWTO on the healing for prosperity, that's kind of focused on an economic strategy. Again, uh, as I looked at a, a lot of websites out there, there were very few from the tour operators that really had decent update of current government and company policy. It was just kind of the old website there. That has to change. You have to have a message of what is going on and people will respect that. It might not be positive. It might be, you know, it might be about the quarantine, but they will have a lot of more respect for you and your company if you are giving them up-to-date type of information. Companies right now should be using uh, Zoom and Skype to engage with people uh, throughout your country, the government and the stakeholders, but you should be reaching out to your suppliers, talking to them about strategy. Your suppliers out there and each, each of the, the uh, different source markets, they're the ones that are gonna have the tune on you know, when travel is gonna be opening up. So that should be a daily or at least a weekly conversation with your suppliers on what you should be doing to prepare and who they should be uh, starting to address their, their marketing. I really think that mass tourism is going to be slow in coming back, but that doesn't really matter for Nepal. You're worried about niche markets, and that's why I related the niche market for, uh, for accessible adventure, but those will be the first to recover. So again, look at smaller groups, focus on healthy lifestyle, spiritual awakening, escape from the urban living, rural culture, adventure isolation. These are things that Nepal uh, and the Himalaya uh, destinations really have a strength in. So I think you will be able to have that attractability there. Uh, companies should look at their canceled bookings and start that dialogue with the people who had canceled because of uh, the, the health crisis. Get them engaged and, and get them excited to rebook uh, as things come out. Look at your loyal customers. Who are the ones that you've had repeat visits to? Get that dialogue going. Encourage them to talk about your country. Encourage them to talk about your, your, your uh, company as well. Again, uh, you have to have that continual conversation on uh, what the entry restrictions are. And the key focus is airline capacity. So you really have to stay on board with your, your uh, with uh, NTB and your, your National Tourism Bureau and the DMO on which airlines are gonna be coming back and which source markets. And that's where your immediate uh, type of marketing should be. Obviously, you've gotta take care of your value chain. There are a lot of uh, people that work is independent contractors for you, uh, that uh, your guides, your Sherpa, your drivers, you know, do whatever, whatever you can to help them. Again, uh, a lot of companies are starting this GoFundMe account. So uh, people who, who really love your company and love your country can, can contribute money, which you can help disperse. And again, some other ideas uh, of emergency management, having local systems and connectivity. You might want to think about mergers and partnerships now. Look at uh, uh, similar types of complementary companies, and you might want to think about merging. And uh, you know, so you could stay strong through this part and become kind of a have a, a, a different uh, uh, product to sell in a, in a bigger market. And again, I think lastly, we're looking at kind of a value-based strategy, as you don't want to return with discounting everything but you wanna add value, which would be add-ons, upgrades, small group sizes, uh, one night free, okay? So these are some of the, the value-based strategies rather than strict discounting, which would be very important. Okay, I know I'm very go close on time here, Pankaj, so I will uh, quickly finish up. Some of the suggestions for, uh, for healing for destinations. Again, uh, this is a whole of government engagement. Uh, government should think of maybe uh, appointing a tourism recovery lead, like a, the lead czar who's maybe outside of the NTB, who really is the one that NTB says, 
we need this done and they they take care of uh, making it uh, pushing it through the government again communication is key uh, we think that uh, putting together an app specifically for uh, new, new visitation that really has uh, particularly a lot of the health connectivity there uh, we talked about uh, Shudana talked about the business support and being able to support employees and the companies uh, in the future, you might have a different level of certification on when uh, certain, um, certain uh, companies and attractions are certified that they're meeting a certain health level. We talked about the marketing to niche markets. Uh, the air seat recovery, it should really be a, a huge focal point for destinations. We need lift, we need seats, and uh, whatever those origins start uh, first should be a focal point for marketing. Uh, there, then you know, start thinking about a new destination video to rebrand yourself to uh, to uh, individual and free focused on these niche markets. Events you'll have to sort of pare down to smaller events, but maybe some that have big broadcast ability there. Traveler incentives, uh, coupons are very important. Free transportation, free medical insurance, or some of the ideas floated out there. And I'll just uh, finish up here. Sorry for going a little late, Pankaj. But again, you should be working with social media influencers. You know, get get uh, some of the the really kind of you know, wild adventure uh, social media guys out there shooting video, talking about how things are there. And these can be your ambassadors. And going back, uh, and then lastly, governments should really be working closely with uh, development organizations, World Bank, UNWTO, USAID, AusAid look at their economic recovery programs. They usually have a lot of funding uh, for things such as this. So Pankaj, sorry for running John. late. Very, you know, very you, comprehensive. You can't ask a professor to give only five minutes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's not uh, really a correct time for you. I know you can go really long and I've seen you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I particularly loved your healing for people, healing for prosperity and healing for destination. Very well summed up. Uh, now, we'll, we'll, we'll have a few questions which are already going in the chat room. So, John, you'll have to again answer. Uh, before that, I'll move on to Thomas. Uh, by sector, airlines and cruise ships are the most impacted ones, as per WTTC. And uh, it also has warned that uh, this pandemic could cut up to 50 million jobs worldwide in travel and tourism industry. Though John's uh, recommendation was very, uh, very, very particular and very descriptive, you having started as a travel agent and now running the travel news publications, what are your takes or what are your suggestions to travel trade industry to stay afloat? Thomas. I'm sorry, I had to unmute me. <laughs> I didn't realize I was talking to yeah. myself. Okay. Um, well, that's, I, I think that's a million dollar question, Banker, but uh, uh, we're, uh, I don't think the industry is ready to really is read not yet in the recovery mode. Um, uh, but it's time to start thinking about it. And I really enjoyed the feedback uh, we got so far in this panel. It, it was very educational. And uh, it is um, definitely something we, we need to start thinking about it. Uh, once we get uh, through uh, the mode of, of recovery, but it doesn't hurt. I guess talking about it, the in the airline industry, I don't think would be the same for some time to come as we just know it a few weeks ago. If you look at uh, large carriers like um, Etihad, um, Turkish Airlines, some some of these guys, uh, they're pretty much down to their knees, and it depends, I think, for the most part, on government assistance to keep these airlines afloat at least for the first part. Um, that aviation is necessary and it's coming back. I, I think we all know this, and, and but it'll take time and it takes money to build this up. The um, market, mass tourism market, I also believe 
will not immediately emerge in the same numbers and in the same way we're used to. I think the biggest chances, and that is I, uh, for Nepal, probably good news is to establish niche markets for those people that are really ready to travel. And these are, in, in my opinion, people who um, are catering to markets Nepal could be very attractive to. When I see it here in Hawaii, I cannot imagine, um, you know, even after uh, this crisis is uh, uh, over, that we're going to have the same number of people coming in at the hotels would all be full. So we all have to be prepared of it, uh, pre prepared for this, and have to make plans to um, uh, to come over this uh, difficult times. It is, and I think no one really knows exactly where we're heading. But there is, yes, I agree with Richard, there is a, a light at the end of the tunnel. People love to travel, people will, will travel. Um, money will slowly build up. Um, but we, of course we have to take in consideration that many businesses also outside the travel and tourism industry will be severely impacted through this crisis. So the money, um, for vacations will not be there. It's not there immediately. It has to build up. And there's a cer certain clientele um, that has resources and they will keep their resources through the crisis. I think we should in immediately address, initially address and niche markets uh, for Nepal, um, I, I think has a, has a very good opportunity here. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Since, uh, if I recall right, you also observing uh, 2003's SARS and swine flu of 2009. Uh, would you like to share some of uh, the insights? Because there it uh, rebounded from March to October. So uh, as yeah. WTTC uh, uh, Director or Magic Director Virginia has said, once the outbreak, outbreak is under control, it would take up to 10 months for tourism sector to return to normalcy. But now we know the normalcy would not be as mass tourism or in the number. So how would you see this in the light of SARS or swine? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't know if you can fully uh, prepare it um, with the SARS situation. The SARS situation was a regional situation, not really a global situation. Um, the, the bad thing and the good thing is that the entire world is affected by it right now. So we, we are, we're all going to start from something less than where we were or just a few weeks ago. Uh, SARS was a different thing. It, it affected mostly destinations in, in Asia, um, but uh, it didn't really affect that much destinations in Europe and in North America. If you um, compare crisis overall, I remember way back the tsunami crisis um, in Southeast Asia. I was actually um, on, on one of the recovery panels um, at the time and uh, worked a little bit from the Pata office actually. And um, one of our biggest fear was discounting. And I'm glad you mentioned discounting before. Um, Learning out of the situation in Bali and in Indonesia back in 2005 or six, I believe it was going through a crisis and you were able to get five-star hotels literally for $5 different the night than you get a, a, a two-star hotels. It forced all the two and three stars hotels out of business. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think government, governments may think about um, antitrust laws and um, give the industry the power to actually have certain guidelines. Uh, so for instance, price ranges, they're set in the five-star range and price ranges, they're set for the three or two or one-star range to keep everyone afloat and everyone in business. What um, Thailand also did uh, after the uh, recovery or during their recovery, I mean, um, at the tsunami crisis is instead of discounting hotels, they focused on reintroducing the destination. So they had massive amount of fam trips, uh, Thai International Airways uh, played along, the hotels played along, uh, they had publicity and the hotels were still empty, but it, it gave a lot of assurance that Thailand is ready for business. <clears throat> so these are all little points, I think um, they need to be discussed. 
for a destination uh, to come back after this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, I have a quick question for Srizana Rana. Uh, now, after this COVID is contained and things get back to normalcy, of course, uh, the hotels will have to take a new measures for safety, hygiene, and also the service side. So the social distancing, what we are now so much used to, would you see that being a negative side or challenging part because people might not want to be as hospitable as earlier at one side? And secondly, <clears throat> do you see this pandemic resulting the biggest dent to the uh, industry and economy? Will it also discourage the young uh, youngsters who are taking up hotel management or tourism management as their career, would they be apprehensive because tourism was the first hit? So will this uh, create kind of a void in five years or seven years down the line? Because students would definitely think and they might not choose. So will that also create some sort of uh, gap in terms of quality workforce supplies uh, down the line? How do you see this? You know, I'm going to ask you one question to everybody, you know. We have been locked down, you know, we have been cooped up in a house. Now, what is the next uh, thing that we all are dreaming of? That <laughs> once, you know, things open, we all want to go for a holiday. So, you know, don't forget that there is a domestic tourism also. For even for Nepalese now to be able to go to different parts of Nepal will still be exciting. So, you know, what I feel is patience is what uh, is required. Um, don't, we should not forget the domestic tourism also. Uh, people are bound to start getting excited traveling. I mean, of course, they have to check the, look, at, look at their pocket and decide the, uh, you know, the kind of destination that they want to choose. But then holiday is something, now it's become part of life, Pankaj. It's not um, something that you, yeah, it is luxury to some point, but at the same time, now I feel it's part of life. So when you sort of get into that um, mode of life for a certain time, you need to take that break. So be it close by destination or further, that depends of course on your budget, but then the concept of holiday will always be there in my opinion, right? So I don't see that, you know, the uh, younger generation should be discouraged with, uh, uh, you know, your this hotel management hospitality um, uh, field, I'm sure, they, you know, I would really think that there is, there will always be scope, and I don't think so they're going to give up, especially in a country like ours, where, uh, you know, we are blessed with so many uh, products, so many destinations, you know, and then um, uh, from this meeting, what I feel very happy about is we really got a lot of tools, actually, you know, the tools that it's time for us to come together, because I remember there was a group of our past presidents already talking about the price, you know, being slashed down and spoiling the market. You know, people are already talking about it because we talk with experience because in the, this is not the first time that we've come through the crisis. You know, this is one of many crises that we've um, come across. So with all the tools that we were, is given to us in this meeting, I think if we come together, you know, the Nepal Tourism Board, you know, the professionals, the private sector, the government, and if we can really plan things together, I think I, I don't see any problem. And coming about the distancing, will that affect the tourism, like you said? You know, we just talked about the culture, the culture side of um, uh, Nepal's tourism. And this was always meant, and if you know that handshaking and side of, um, you know, greeting with, uh, you know, kissing each other was never our culture. It was namaste was our culture. So now, you know, it's like going back to what I remember, like, you know, 40 years back. I mean, there was this distance we always maintained. When we ate, when we, ate we kept a distance, you know, we did our namaste. You know, there are so many things that our culture, it was a way of life, you know. So maybe we can review that and see that, go back in times and, Thank you know, you. what that was. Thank you. Thank you, Srezana Rana. It's really uh, enlightening. Yes, Namaste has always been our culture. And let me also uh, tell all the participants and panelists that we have exactly eight minutes uh, to wrap this up. So 
I have a few questions. Uh, probably John would like to take this. Uh, this is this comes from uh, Sukendra Gurbacharya. Uh, okay. What do you want? Uh, how should the employees be handled in crisis? What is the general practice in the world in such cases? Uh, the employer will not be able to support them where there is no earning. I think this has kind of been replied by Srejana Rana uh, that one month. So I don't think this will be. Um, but would you like to uh, set some light on this? Well, I think it's been, uh, has been sort of the, the brought up is that, you know, how can the government assist business in keeping people on payroll? at least through this, this introductory shock. And so uh, there are a lot of different uh, approaches with each different nation, uh, which uh, having to use their, their resources a certain way. Uh, and so uh, Thomas brought up that uh, US uh, people are getting a, a $1,200 uh, input from the government. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways of sort of looking at it. Uh, again, I kind of recommended, especially if you're a small business and you have a, a, a kind of a deep well of, of, uh, of, of, of customers that you've worked with who really appreciate you, you might wanna start a GoFundMe account. And so, which is uh, where people can donate and you could say that money is gonna be going to help our employees. In particular, as I mentioned, the value chain of all the people that you contract down the line, the drivers, the Sherpa, the guides, you know, the tea houses, uh, that's a way of kind of reaching out to maybe some of your, your, your wealthier customers that maybe they will donate and you can use those funds. So I think a lot of that. And then I also uh, looked at possible mergers, uh, possible maybe uh, asking for you know, a foreign partner to step in. And maybe that's what your suppliers back in uh, different source markets can say, hey, this is an opportune time to become and start forming partnerships and bringing in sort of new investors. This is a great time over the next three or four months, get us over the hump, keep our, our employees there. And I think Srijan also mentioned, this is a great time for capacity building as well, to be uh, focused on training, focused on improving your property or improving your service, looking at different uh, types of destinations as well. So I think those are some Thank you. comments. Thank you, John. Um, I have one question from Sudan Suvedi, who is a manager from Nepal Tourism Board. Uh, what he asked, well, at this time, reaching and communication is the key. Uh, we can use online platforms. How industry can come together more strong? Um, perhaps uh, this would go to Thomas because he is into media, communication. Yes, and, and this, uh, Pankaj, I think in today's I'll world... I'll give you a minute. Oh, <laughs> sorry. In, in today's <laughs> world, uh, yes, uh, today's world, the internet is a wonderful tool uh, through social media, through online media. Um, everyone is connected to everyone. And there are tools out there um, that could not just getting an advertising message out, but getting messages out that are uh, proactive um, promoting without wanting to promote something. Um, yes, I, I think any destination should in, invest in, um, in such capacity to reach um, the world and, and, and change and form the image of a destination and the opportunities a destination gives. Um, I also maybe wanted to add about um, uh, financing, um, what is a big thing specifically in, in North America. Um, it, it, uh, banks and um, institutions should find a way of uh, uh, giving consumers the opportunity to finance trips to Nepal and anywhere else without interest. And the interest could be the promotion we're giving instead of uh, lower hotel prices, um, hotel could cover the interest for guests to finance and make payments interest-free for, for a while. I think there are a lot of tools we can, uh, we have to our exposure and two operators um, in the US would probably be um, wide open to look at these tools. Nepal also directly and indirectly could benefit from. 
And that again, Thank you. of course, is something what the media could uh, circulate easily. Well, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, well, regarding the social media, there's a question. As we all feel that social media is like fire, you can cook a meal or you can burn the entire city, <laughs> right? So there's a question from Mahendra that is social media helping? Mahendra Raj Paudel Heni, we call him. Uh, is social media helping COVID to be more destructive for tourism industry? Social media is times powerful uh, now that then at the time of SARS, swine flu, Ebola in the recent past. So how do we go about this uh, double-edged sword? Uh, perhaps John, would you like to be impromptu one minute? Ah, you are, you have to, yeah. Yeah. okay. I'm, I got you. Right. So yeah, this is very important. And again, I think Nepal is sitting in a very good spot in the sense that you don't have an excessive crisis there. So you are one of the, the most uh, uh, healthiest uh, countries out there. So that's very positive and you start pushing that note. Uh, as part of my presentation, I said that you really look at trying to get your, your adventure influencers there and starting to really uh, you know, create some content for you. So this is a fantastic time to be in inviting uh, some of the, uh, the influencers there, the social media people of your niche markets and having them start producing really good content of videos and saying and really uh, focusing on, hey, we're, we're, we've got business going now and we're going to be ready whenever the world is ready uh, to start traveling again. Thank you, John. Now, the last question uh, before we close comes from Sandeepa Thapa Busnet. She is the Vice President of Education of Tourism Toastmaster and uh, Director of uh, Hospitality College in Kathmandu. Her question goes to Srejana Rana. How will and Hotel Association of Nepal create policy in price competition and also any plans on improving sanitation and hygiene standards in Nepal? Absolutely, Musadipa, because I don't know if you're aware, but the government has come up with standardization for all categories of hotels and it's just come out. So like what I was talking uh, earlier, that if we can start now uh, following that uh, standardization, that includes sanitation, hygiene, garbage management, everything. So I think now uh, the standardization has come after, I think nearly five years, Hotel Association did spend a lot of time with the uh, uh, tourism department. So I think this is a time now uh, we start implementing that. And of course, monitoring is one of the biggest uh, challenge, which I feel like professions like your institution, we need help to go and make sure that you know we work very closely with the government to monitor that. So I think in that case, we will be able to come up to certain standard on hygiene, sanitation, so, you know, safety, security, food safety, all that will come together. Thank you, uh, Sreza Narana. So now this comes to the end, but before I close, I would like to thank all the participants, uh, panelists for a very insightful discussion. Of course, this is not going to change the entire scenario, but it will definitely inject uh, much needed hope. As we, as the saying goes that uh, in the situation, desperate situation like this, when you cannot change the situation, you change your mindset. And this discussion of an hour has definitely injected that ray of hope what we needed and it has been a healer as John said, healing for people, healing for prosperity, healing for destinations. I think if we juggle around that and be very mindful and do effective communication as Thomas pointed out, uh, you know, we keep our uh, stakeholders and uh, clients engaged in effective and meaningful communication. I think this cannot last very long. And as Srizan Arana pointed out that we are just waiting to get out of our home because holidaying at home has been pretty long. So people's motivation to get out to nature will remain uh, in all thicks and thin. So people will travel. So 
this point of time, we need preparedness. Let's utilize this time for capacity building, keeping our moral high. Yes, there are challenges, uh, but it will, uh, it's going to go. So this is exactly what we are doing to reflect, reinvent, and look forward uh, for the coming season. Because as we know in tourism, there's a lean season and then there's a high season. And when it rains, we take out umbrella, we don't cry over rain. So let's, let's uh, <laughs> take this forward. And I would like to thank uh, IDI for creating this platform and Tourism Toastmaster for technical support and uh, as a knowledge partner. Uh, we have uh, the sergeant at arms of uh, Tourism Toastmaster, Roshan Gimiri, working behind the scene, ensuring that all this technical stuff is going well. And I would like to uh, hand over, and then oh, thank you the participants. Uh, we have 35 plus, and thank you for all your questions. Uh, and we look forward for next version. And I would like to invite uh, Executive Director of uh, IDI, International Development Institute, uh, thanking him to say his parting words in one minute. <laughs> Would you, Sumantin? Thank, thank you, Pankaj, and thank you uh, for moderating this important event. And also thank you for all the participants, and especially for John and Thomas for staying late, especially John, John uh, keeping up with me. And uh, we're looking forward to a lot more series focusing on tourism and uh, other aspects of tourism, economics of tourism and other things. So I look forward to our schedule, our website, and we'll be posting there as well as reaching out to you. Having said that, Good night uh, from US, aloha and namaste to Nepal. Thank you very much. And thank you all the participants for participating in today. Thank you. Uh, hello. Like this. Thank you. <laughs> good night and have a good day. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>